Fantastic. Okay. So hello, everybody, and um, welcome to today's webinar. I'm Helen Allen, and I work on digital language teaching, learning and training at Cambridge Assessment English. And my name's Sean Morgan, and I work in the research department of Cambridge Assessment English. So this is the first in a series of webinars about assessment in an online environment. Some of you will have, had, will have chosen actually to teach online, but I expect that many of you will be joining us today because you've recently had to move to online teaching. So, Sean, let's get started. Yes. First of all, we'd like to ask you a question. Use the poll. How confident do you feel about assessing learning online? This, that might be assessment in an online classroom or assessments that you set the learners to do at home in their own time. Use the poll to tell us how confident do you feel about assessing learning online? And I can see the numbers are there already. So we've got about maybe sort of 10, 11% of you are not really sure how you feel right now. Mm -hmm. About 37% are not confident. About 40% are confident and 8% of you are reporting that you're feeling very confident. So that's great. Um, if you're feeling confident or very confident, we'll be sharing lots of ideas you can pick and choose from in the webinar today. If you're feeling less confident, we're aiming to give you some key principles to help guide your online assessment practice. And you might prefer just to pick out a couple of ideas to start with. OK, so today we are going to be looking at formative assessment or assessment for learning, the kind of evaluation and testing that you might do in any classroom, either at, as a teacher with your students or through independent learning tasks. We're going to be looking at principles, strategies and tools that can help you check understanding and measure performance in order to inform the next step in learning, to help you to understand what students can do, or can't do yet and what they need to do to progress. We also want to help you create, share and analyse assessment tasks and data safely and efficiently. We'll start by looking at some challenges in online assessment and highlighting strategies that you can use. Then we'll be revisiting the principles behind a good test and sharing some practical ideas for assessment tasks. We'll be thinking about why specifying criteria is important and how the CFR helps us to design assessments for further learning. And throughout the webinar, we'll be looking at digital tools that can help you assess skills and language in your context, in your online context. So let's start with the challenges. Yes, I just see a question there about whether we're recording the webinar. There will be, after the webinar, there will be um, a recording available on Cambridge English TV. Yes, there will be. OK, so um, challenges. Yes. I'll give you a moment to have a look at the, the kind of challenges that teachers report on this slide. So teachers experience the transition to online classroom assessment in different ways, and it does really depend on your context. You might be concerned about the amount of time it will take you to prepare, deliver and mark assessments online or how to use new tools. But we'll be looking at tools that can help you. You might need to adapt existing assessment resources or find new ones for the online environment, especially if students can't print out paper tests or they're doing their assessment on a small screen or they're using a shared device maybe and can't use it at, for example, 10 o'clock on a Monday morning when you want to run your test. You might be worried about managing learner behaviour, helping learners to approach their assessments in the right way, or cheating. And it's also important to think about security and safety around data, platforms and use of audio and video. And of course, there's lots of people involved in assessment. There might be mixed messages or expectations from your institution, parents, the learners themselves, and perhaps even other teachers around the value or the purpose of online testing. OK, here's a question for you right in the chat again. What are your top three concerns or challenges in assessing learning online? That might be assessment in an online classroom 
or assessments that you set learners to do at home in their own time. So what are your top three concerns or challenges in assessing English learning online? And these might be different from the ones that we've just mentioned. It's really helped for us, for us to understand the challenges you face. So please tell us about them in the chat. And I can see here people are writing about cheating, about sharing devices, having the right tools, the credibility of answers, yeah, whether, whether, whether they're actually their answers or not. Time Reliability, to we'll come back to that, yeah. Yeah, lots of people are putting in about um, being fair, reliability, all that kind of stuff, plagiarism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, we'll come back and talk uh, about some of those things as we go through the webinar and through the webinar series as well. So let's have a look at some strategies that can help us to overcome some of these challenges. So many publishers are currently providing courseware that you need to use in online classes or eBooks for learners to use at home for your course books. Audio files for course books are usually available on publisher websites too. And it's worth checking your course book publisher's website as this will provide you with content for both online learning and assessment and help you to align online and face-to-face -face learning when you go back to school. Your exam provider may also provide a range of online tests or activities to help you assess learners in your classroom and online. And you'll find links to Cambridge English support at the end of these slides. That's in the PDF that you can download in the, um, the file section. You can use learning activities to evaluate performance informally, integrating short tasks where you focus specifically on evaluation can help you understand where learners are having problems or finding things easy early on. If learners know you're evaluating and recording their performance, and giving feedback continually, not just at specific test points. This may help them to engage in their learning more consistently. It's really good if you can develop, use and share assessment criteria with learners in written form so that they can see what they're being assessed on. And this helps both you and your learners see patterns in what they can do and what they can work on to improve. And we'll come back to this again in the webinar. Even better, Getting learners to use criteria to assess their own work or their peers' work often means they become more actively engaged in understanding what they're good at and where they can develop. You don't have to do all assessment in an online classroom. You can set independent assessment tasks to do at home. And I know that this is a hard one because you can't physically control the environment or the help that students might get. But this is perhaps part of building a long-term attitude and behaviour change. In terms of learning and assessment for learning, if we're going to be delivering more education online in the future, we need to give learners the skills they need to take responsibility for their own learning, which is a good thing for them and for their ability to learn effectively throughout life. And you can consider how you organise contact time with learners, groups and your class. It may be that setting independent tasks and following up with tutorials helps your learners focus better on the tasks, cheat less, and feel motivated to make the most of that more personal or individual or group time with you. You can use that time for assessing their speaking with a short task, giving personalised and targeted feedback, or talking through problems and strategies. And of course, digital tools can really help. But think carefully about what's right for you and your learners. Today, we aim to show you some examples to help you identify what might work in your context. So tools. Beyond uh, paper assessments, you can collect assessment evidence from activities that you run in an online classroom, whether it's whole class or group or pair work, or via an online notice board or social channel. And you can collect evidence from smaller groups and individual calls online too, in written and in spoken formats. You can collect assessment evidence from automatically marked online quizzes and tests. 
You can collect pieces of written and spoken evidence to create a portfolio. You can get better quality work from learners. We'll look at this later. And an auto marker can save time with marking writing. And social tools can also facilitate peer assessment prior to teacher assessment. And you can check for um, plagiarism as well with different tools. So we'll be looking at more examples, as I said today, but also in the rest of the series, which focus on assessing different skills. So let's now think about what makes a good test. OK, research has shown that a good test is based on four principles, and these are the same for assessment in a face to face context or an online context. The first testing principle is validity. One way that you can make a test more valid is by asking two questions. The first is, does the test measure what you wanted to measure and nothing else? Here's a simple example. Imagine a teacher writes the following test item for their class of beginner students. How much is two plus two? Do you think this would be a valid test of their English knowledge? Why? Or why not? Tell us what you think in the chat. Yeah, where do you think this would be a valid test of their English knowledge and why or why not? So we're looking in the chat for your answers. We've got the first one here says no. <laughs> <laughs> no, because that's the math. No, it's maths. Most of you saying no here. A couple of yeses. Okay. All right, Sean. So that was a very obvious example, of course. <laughs> when something else is measured apart from English, the assessment community call it construct irrelevant variance. In other words, we're assessing knowledge which is not relevant to the test purpose. So we need to be sure that the test is measuring English language ability and nothing else. Here's the second question you can ask to increase te test validity. Does the test measure skills that are relevant to real life language use? What we're interested in here is to what extent the test item or task reflects how language is used to communicate in real life settings. For example, if we used an indirect test of writing, such as a Gapville, or a speaking test using a read aloud test task, these types of tasks would not represent real life scenarios or elicit real life thinking skills. And because of this, they would score lower on validity. On the other hand, imagine, for example, a, for a speaking test, a student has to give a one minute monologue. There's an example here. Give a short talk to your classmates on the best things to do in your hometown say what you think they should visit and why this would be a good idea. Now, even though this is a monologue, this task taps into features of real life speaking, such as selecting grammar to construct meaning, producing a range of vocabulary to talk about the subject, using connectors to organize and highlight information in a logical or persuasive way, and using evaluative or interactive language to connect with the listener. So we can see that a simple monologue, which is easy and practical to administer, elicits language and thinking skills relevant to real life communication. So validity, assessing what you want to measure and nothing else is an important consideration when writing a task item or test item. Student motivation is increased if they're practicing real life skills, which will be re relevant beyond the classroom context. And this could have a positive impact outside the classroom too, because students are equipped with skills they can really use to communicate. Yes, that's right. And maybe one of the problems of doing this in the online environment is that often it's, it's easier to share an online quiz that tells you student scores and which questions are more or less challenging, or maybe share a paper test that students complete and return to you. So doing realistic 
speaking tests can be more of a challenge, but it really is, it is possible. Mm -hmm. If your students or their parents have given consent for you to use audio or video recording, students could record their responses and share their video tasks via your school LMS or email or a shared notice board like Padlet, which is the example on the slide here. It depends what's suitable in your context. And if you're able to use video conferencing or a telephone for one-to-one -one calls, you can also listen to the learner's performance live. It doesn't have to be recorded. Even if you're focusing on spoken interaction rather than monologue, you can still capture this. If your students can connect and record conversations outside the classroom, they can record pair speaking tasks, or you could invite pairs to a call with you to do the task. If this isn't possible, you could use an online classroom with breakout rooms. These are additional uh, online spaces in a larger classroom where they can do the task in pairs. And then you can pop into the different rooms to monitor or you can ask them to self or peer assess to evaluate their performance. This example here with Padlet is great though. You upload an assessment task and criteria. Learners record and upload their video and another student can listen and use the criteria to give feedback in the comment box. Learners do need training to give feedback. For example, they could give a positive comment or a response to the content of the video and then list good examples of language and skills and areas for improvement. Or you could simply give them a tick box if they're just starting out with a peer assessment or self-assessment, give them a tick box and that helps avoid misunderstandings between students when they're communicating about strengths and weaknesses. Okay, Sean. Okay, so we've looked at validity with the question, do we measure the right thing? The second important test characteristic is reliability. In other words, do we measure student performance consistently? Now, reliability is easier to control with discrete single items, such as multiple choice questions to test reading or listening, such as in Kahoot. Because students can read the options, tick the box, or produce a short written response to a question. However, when we're assessing speaking or writing formants, like in the out spoken output on the left, variation in scoring can creep in and it's more difficult to keep reliability high. Hello. Okay, let's, uh, let's explore that a little bit. So can you tell us what you think? What factors could lower the reliability of scoring when you're assessing speaking or writing performance. Tell us what you think in the chat. What factors could lower the reliability of scoring when you're assessing speaking or writing performance? Let's have a little look. I'm just waiting for some of the things to load. Mm -hmm. Using an online translator. Mm -hmm. Bad internet connection. <laughs> Some of no the rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not enough time. The teacher factor, Sean. Yes. Yes, you've got some good examples here. One of the um, uh, factors that can really affect reliability, as one of you said, is the rater, the teacher themselves. So if the teacher tends to mark on the strict side and her colleague who works in the next parallel class is a little bit more lenient, then that obviously introduces reliability in the, the marks across the, the different sections. Um, another factor, a teacher factor could be fatigue. If you've been examining all day, doing speaking tests by the end, you can get a little bit tired and that could alter your marks. There's also something that we call rate of bias where teachers unconsciously prefer one gender or one pupil above the others. And of course, there's also differences in test delivery. So if you deliver the test inconsistently in, in terms of the time you give the students, the way you give the uh, prompt or the the instructions or the questions that you ask them, then the tasks for different students may be different and not equivalent in difficulty. Um, another other factors which could also affect when you're online testing and the students are working at home is the student home test environment or the availability or the sophistication of the digital devices they have. 
um, you need perhaps to encourage students to find a quiet place to do a test if they can, and if possible, to use a device with a larger screen rather than their mobile phone. You need to be clear too about how you want the students to take the test, how they set up their environment, what the time limits are, and the time of day, perhaps especially for young students who may get tired towards the end of the day. The good news is though that there are easy steps to increase validity and reliability and you're probably doing some or most of these anyway. So here are some tips to increase the reliability of your online tasks and tests. First of all, decide on your construct, which aspect of performance you want to measure. This might be spoken interaction in speaking or the ability to organize writing coherently in writing skills. The CEFR, the Common European Framework of Reference, gives ex is an excellent tool to help you identify specific aspects of communicative language ability. Um, some of you may not have heard or not used the CFR, but it's a language framework which can be used to describe language ability in a consistent and standard way. And it provides teachers, a, it gives teachers a common language to use to describe performance. So if you haven't seen it, we suggest you have a look at it and see if it could be right for your context. Okay, so next, select or design a test or task which will elicit this aspect of performance. So imagine you want to measure students' ability to structure and organize a piece of writing. You need an appropriate task to do this. This could be according to the level of your students um, at A2 or B1 level, a simple email requesting information. If you have students which are or at a slightly higher level, good intermediate performance, B2, you can ask them to write an opinion article. And if some of you are working with very high level students at C1 or even C2, then you would want to give them something more demanding, such as an essay discussing and evaluating abstract topics. Once you've decided what you want to test and designed or selected your task, make a final check that the task, in task instructions are clear and that key instructions are in bold. The time, the time available is clearly specified. The number of words expected is clearly specified and also make the assessment criteria explicit to your students so they know exactly what they're going to be assessed on. And we'll be talking more about this in a minute. Helen? So I just saw a question um, asking about how to get access to the CFR. So in the file section, we have a PDF of the slides and there are links to the CFR and the companion volume, the newer part of, um, in the slides. So you can use those to find them. Okay, um, learning platforms or lots of different learning platforms often allow you to write and to share assignments with learners. And once they've submitted their work, you're often able to add assessment comments or grades. This is great. You can see an example here in Microsoft Teams. I've chosen this tool uh, just as an example. So it could be another kind of platform. Um, and the task here has the construct clearly identified. It's a suitable task and I've given clear instructions. So platforms that give you this kind of functionality can help both you and your learners to focus on what is being tested and focus your time and your effort in the right areas. With the, the speaking assignment here, um, for a B1 assignment, I was able to create and share a rubric for the speaking task that we saw earlier. Here I've added descriptors for range, accuracy, fluency, interaction and cohesion across the levels B2, B1 and A2, because my target is B1, but I want to know if they're actually performing at that level or lower or higher. If your learners are going to read descriptors like this, though, you'll probably need to either translate the descriptors, because the language here that you can see on your screen is above level, really, or you might rewrite them in a way that makes sense for you and your learners if you have some kind of common language um, for describing what you're trying to achieve. 
So you have the descriptors um, or the rubric that you're going to use to assess the assignment. And when you receive and start marking the task, you can see very easily in this particular tool and read and select the right level descriptor. You can also add comments if you want to. And once this is done, you can give a summary grade or a comment and return the assignment to the learner. So it's nice and easy. It's a nice, easy um, experience. So this is a good function to look out for if you're choosing a learning platform. The ability to add a rubric or assessment criteria to help you to be consistent in your marking and to make those criteria also visible to learners. Okay, Sean. Okay, so we looked at validity, we looked at reliability, and now we're going to look at the third test quality, practicality. All tests and assessment need to be practical in terms of the time resources and human resources needed to write the tasks, administer the test and score, score it. Teachers have never been busier. So how can we make assessment practical without compromising the other characteristics of a good test? Well, there are a number of ways that you can reduce the burden. One way is by using automarking technologies to help you. If it's a case of right or wrong answers, a survey or a quiz tool like Typeform can give both you and your learners the results and you can find out where students need more support via the reporting function. But automarking can also help with writing and speaking. They can remove the need for you to spend time on correction of surface errors such as grammar, word choice and pronunciation and they'll give the students immediate feedback on what they need to do to improve. This allows you to focus on more important skills such as discourse and um, language interaction based assessment criteria. You could also fo focus on a different criterion for different assessments or tasks. For example, you might decide to look at cohesion only for a specific piece of writing. Or you could focus just on language for interaction rather than grammar in a particular speaking test. Interaction is a key skill in speaking. So by including this as, as a criterion, you're developing an important life skill and improving the validity of your assessment. It's not necessary to give feedback to every student on every area of strength or weakness every time you assess them. You'll become exhausted if you do that. When looking at writing and speaking, you could give an initial impression mark for all students uh, working towards the level, at the level, above the level, and then concentrate on a smaller group of learners for more detailed fee feedback each week, perhaps. And this might include a tutorial for the group or individuals. Involving students in their own assessment or assessment of peers not only takes the burden of the teacher, but also develops students' knowledge of what they're being assessed on, so they're able to become more independent in their learning. We've seen an example of this with Microsoft in Microsoft Teams already, and we'll look more at how we can share criteria with students shortly. Thanks. Okay, so here is an example of an, a writing automarker. It's called Write and Improve. And with this tool, <clears throat> you can assign an existing writing task or create and share your own task. When students write their response and submit it, the automarker gives them both a CEFR level, so it's a A2, um, B1, B2, so it gives them a level for their writing for this task, and also information about where they can improve. The student can then follow the advice to improve their writing before resubmitting. And you can see on the, the right hand side of the screen here, you can see the student's writing and it's colored uh, depending on how, how sure the automarker is that they've um, written something well. And then it gives tips for specific areas where it's sure they've made a mistake and gives advice on how to correct it. Um, so once you as the teacher receive the final writing, you can concentrate on the writing criteria that you want to use to assess the piece of writing. So if you encourage your students to write, improve, correct the mistakes that they've made and resubmit even a couple of times, this is really great. It really helps them to draft and to improve their writing. Research has shown that good writers do redraft 
And it's lovely because as the teacher, you can actually see the original drafts as well as the final submission in this tool. So you can see the progress, the journey, which things were easy for them to correct and where they're actually really struggling and where you need to give more help. I haven't put an example on the slide here, but you can use um, an auto, well, speech recognition um, for, for speech as well. A very simple idea is to get students to record their response to a speaking task and then play or watch it while they've got a speech recognition turned on. Something like Google Docs would work. So you press play in your video recording and you press the microphone on Google Docs and it tries to transcribe what it hears from the video. It becomes immediately apparent where problems with pronunciation lie and students can practice and re-record submitting their original and final recordings again. It's really nice to see so that you can grade their work but also see where to give feedback or tasks and resources to help them to continue to improve. In my experience, this kind of activity, most learners really love it because it's really, it's really, when you actually see whether it can understand you or not, it's really immediate feedback about whether it, it can hear the words. But you have to also be really careful to set the task at the right level. For assessment also, you might want to avoid read aloud speaking tasks unless you're focusing specifically on remedial practice of pronunciation or if you're training learners to work in maybe a call centre or to read out the news, for example. Um, that's a bit more experimental, that one, but it's, it's a nice idea and it helps give learners more feedback, immediate feedback, um, not just from you, the teacher. OK, okay. Shan. So that leads us to the fourth important test quality, which is impact. And naturally, we want that to be as positive as possible. On a macro level, large scale tests all have impact on teaching and learning, on the test taker and what goes on in the classroom. At a micro level in the classroom or at institutional level, so do tests that you carry out. If we make assessments valid, reliable, practical, and most importantly, relevant to the test taker needs, then the impact in the classroom will be positive and a virtual circle of assessment and learning can be established. The good news is that we've never been luckier than today. We have the CEFR to help us understand learning progressions and situate learning and learning goals within an internationally re recognized framework. And again, we'll look at this shortly. And we also have digital tools to help us elicit and collect evidence of learning. Scores, performance samples can also be recorded online to, co to compile a rich learning profile for each class and student. That's right. And I've, I've put together some examples of kind of dashboards here for you. Uh, which is really interesting. So when we're thinking about the purpose of assessment, it's really to inform learning. It's an essential part of learning. It's like an indicator that tells us where to expend effort to achieve our goals. And when you're teaching and assessing in a class or across classes, there is a lot of data. And this is where technology can support the teacher. Most digital tools or learning platforms with a teacher account will have some kind of dashboard. Simple reporting can often tell you about learner progress and scores, how much they've done and how well. You may also be able to dig deeper and see which questions learners or groups of learners have had problems with so that you can use this information to inform your teaching or independent learning resources. Another way of bringing together the bigger picture is to use a portfolio tool. Uh, some of these allow you to tag student responses with criteria and grades to track performance over time. And you can see in the bottom left hand, this is from um, Write and Improve in the bottom left hand corner. And you can see here the submissions and how over time the level of the work increases. Whatever um, tasks and tools you use, a simple spreadsheet can help you keep track of student performance. If you're using multiple digital tools, it's going to also help you bring together information into one place. And it's a great way um, to help you to understand any discrepancies, perhaps, in performance if you've got everything in one place. For example, um, a learner may score very highly in their writing, reading and listening, or grammar and vocabulary focused tasks. But when you hear them speak, 
they're performing well below what you might expect. So what's going on in that scenario? Well, perhaps they truly find speaking more challenging, in which case they would benefit from more practice activities and understanding which areas they need to focus on to improve. Or perhaps they've been having a little help with the reading, listening and other tasks from the internet or their dictionary or their friends or maybe even a parent. In either case, this is where some contact time may benefit both you and the student. Having and referring to a record of performance is going to help you show evidence of learning to the student or their parents. Having one-to-one -one time where you ask the learner to do a reading or writing or speaking or listening test in your presence can also help. Or running online sessions via video conferencing where you can observe a group of students actually doing a test. And importantly, this kind of personal contact whether you can run tutorials or whether in written form via email or chat or whatever tool you use, it really can play a key part in running effective assessments. OK, so we've mentioned the CEFR a couple of times and let's look now a little bit more closely at how we can use the CFR to help us develop criteria for teacher and student assessment. As we've mentioned, one very effective way to engage learners and make assessment meaningful is to share assessment criteria with your class. Research has shown that this has a number of benefits. First of all, it makes learners of where, where they are now in their learning journey and where they want to be. It increases transparency and fairness because students know what they're going to be tested on. It increases learner responsibility and reassures them that standards are not arbitrary. It also focuses them on criteria rather than the grade. And finally, it develops learner autonomy and positive attitudes to learning. So a valid way of doing this is to select a task from the CEFR, which describes language learning progressions from beginner level to mastery. Using the framework and aligning your class learning objectives to it is an excellent way of making assessment meaningful beyond the context of the classroom. Most of the work has been done for you by experts in the field. All you have to do is select the appropriate level for your class and choose appropriate descriptors to set clear learning goals for each skill. The CFR is now available online and you'll find your link in the handout for you to look at after the webinar. It's quite a big document, but don't be put off by this as what you need to do is work with the levels and skills relevant to your own teaching context. Helen? That's right. So before we go on, I just want to ask you um, another question. So can you tell us in the chat do you or your organisation align English language learning to the CEFR? Does the institution we work in align learning to the CEFR? Or do you use it yourself more informally? Write yes if you use the CEFR and tell us what levels you work at. Write no if you don't use the CEFR. Use the chat to tell us. Do you or your organisation align English language learning to the CEFR? Write yes if you do and what levels. Write no if you don't. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can see like a real mix here. Yes, yes. Yeah, we've got a range of levels too. Yeah, and it's important to say, I mean, this is it's not the only reference, it's not the only guide, right. but, um, but there, there are other um, frameworks in other countries as well. You might use your um, a, a frame of workers, which is designed by your school, for example, or your ministry. <laughs> okay, Shah. Okay. Let's have a closer look at this. Now then, the CFR is described in different levels of detail and it's presented in table format. As you can see here on the slide, the first table shows the general scale describing overall performance at each CEFR level. The second table gives you a self-assessment grid, and we'll come back to this in a moment. And the further tables are much more detailed, and they give you what we call the illustrative, illustrative scale with more detailed objectives for each level. 
So let's look first at the global scale, which describes overall performance in receptive skills, writing and speaking. Now, on the slide, you can't see much detail, but you can have a look at it later on on your handout. You can see that on the left of the global scale, uh, that it's divided into three types of user, basic, independent and proficient. Basic is levels A1 and A2, independent B1 and B2, and proficient are C1 and C2. Most of you teaching in secondary schools are probably working somewhere in the bottom half of this global scale. So for today, we're going to concentrate on A2 and B1 and see how the descriptors can help us in daily practice to structure goals and assess progress. Let's look at the overall descriptors for A2 and B1. The descriptors at the top of the boxes refer to receptive skills, listening and reading. You can just look at those. The description in the middle box describes writing skills. And in the bottom of the box, they describe speaking skills. So when you go to look at these overall descriptors for your level, remember that that'll help you orient yourself to which skill you want to um, assess. So what are the some of the key differences in functions and domains for these two levels A2 and B1. Let's look at the writing descriptors for A2. We can see the functions are routine and simple and the domain is familiar. It says learners can communicate in simple and routine tasks requiring a simple and direct exchange of information on familiar and routine matters. But if we look at B1, we see that there has been a small incremental change in what is expected. Learners can produce simple connected texts on topics which are familiar and of personal interest. So we can expect a B1 learner to write a little bit more connected tests and texts rather. And we can also expect them to perhaps go, on, go beyond the familiar domain if they're particularly interested in a topic. So if your student has a passion for cinema or fishing, uh, they may be write, motivated to write about something beyond the personal and familiar domain. So do these overall descriptors align with the kind of English that you are working at? Tell us in the chat, do these overall descriptors A2 and B1 align with the kind of English level you're working at. Can you tell us in the chat? Yes, yeah, somebody, oh, somebody's at higher levels, B2 and C1. Okay, yes. Yes, okay. Somebody says, I use the CFR for myself, that's great. Yeah. Really good. Okay. So if they don't seem quite right for your class, you can go to the global uh, descriptors and check the levels just above B2 or below A1, these two levels, until you found the level appropriate for your teaching context. And once you've done this and matched your learners to a level on the global scale, you can get, then go to the illustrative scales for each skill. And here we have the right overall reading comprehension skill. Um, you can select and adapt descriptors to set goals for your own teaching context. So if you look here at the CFR descriptors for overall reading comprehension, um, you can see the different skills that you might expect to see, reading skills you might expect to see uh, for your class level. And remember, when you select descriptors and develop them to use in class, it's good pra practice to refer to the levels and the descriptors when you develop lessons, and particularly when you're assessing your learners, so they too become familiar with them and are kept in the assessment loop. They ne do need to know what the assessment criteria are. And finally, speaking of learners, the beauty of the CFR is that it includes them in the assessment process. 
by providing self-assessment descriptors for all skills and at all levels. You can see here that we've taken the descriptor for A2 reading and split it up to create a self-assessment chart. So the student can write down their target. If you can do it, they can do it for self-assessment or they could ask a peer and assess, to assess them and write in the third column, someone else confirms I can do this. Okay, you can share these descriptors to help learners assess their own performance, set personal goals and take some of the assessment burden off you, the teacher. Most importantly, they will acquire a sense of agency and hopefully become responsible for their own learning. Helen was saying earlier on that perhaps this takes a change of attitude over time and this could be part of it, the taking responsibility for goal setting and um, learn independently. You may need to translate the uh, descriptors for lower levels, but having an external frame of reference where le learners can see where that what they're aiming for can be really motivating. Okay. Yeah, that's right. It moves, moves it away from a grade and that can help parents become more involved as well once they understand what it is that they're, they're really trying to achieve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, so we're coming to um, the end of the webinar now. Um, let's sum up with a couple of key points. So here are a few considerations for when you're thinking about assessing your learners online. You can use assessment features like progress tests and learning activities from your course book to assess your learners online. Look out for free coursework, uh, free courseware, sorry, eBooks and other assessment support provided by your coursebook publisher and your assessment provider. Find out what your learner's workspace is like at home. If learners are sharing a device or workspace with family, it's important to understand whether they'll be able to do their assessment tasks at a specified time or whether you need to provide tasks that can be done anytime with guidance for setting up a distraction-free workspace, the conditions you want them to work under and why. If you want to record, store or share audio and video of learners, and this might extend also to portfolio work, you probably need their consent or parental consent. Your institution may already have this covered, but you should make sure you understand what you can and you can't do. If you're teaching children, you also need to understand what tools you can use with them. Under 13s usually need to have parental consent to have accounts in many tools, unless your institution has, has subscribed to the tool and has institutional accounts for the learners. <clears throat> this can differ by country, um, especially in age uh, ranges, um, so you should check. And you must also make sure any online classrooms, notice boards, chats or other tools are set up in a private mode so that only teachers and learners can access them or parents if that's appropriate and so that learners can only access content that they're supposed to see. Educational accounts usually provide better privacy and protection for your learners and their data. Okay, and um, let's revisit then some of the strategies we've mentioned over the webinar. First of, all, first of all, integrate assessment tasks into learning activities where you can. Develop and share assessment criteria explicitly in written form, format so they are clear and understood by learners. Get learners to use the criteria for peer and self-assessment. Use in-class and out-of-class assessments. Give personalised and targeted feedback and one-to-one -one tutorials if possible. And finally, choose the digital tools that are right for you or your learner and your learners. Yeah, that's a really important point there. You don't need to use like hundreds of digital tools. You just need to choose ones that you think will work best in your context. Um, and the webinars that are coming up in the next few weeks um, will hopefully give you lots of very practical and, and examples in more detail to help you select those. OK, so we've been looking at assessing learning online. And you may have had lots of recent experience teaching and assessing learning online. Just before we answer your questions, we'd like to know if you think classroom assessment should change, especially as we move more online. So can you tell us in the chat, do you think classroom assessment should change? In what way and what kind of tools would help you? So please tell us what you think in the chat. Should classroom assessment change? In what way 
and what kind of tools would help you? I mean, you might think it shouldn't change, but tell us what you think in the chat. My source, yes, I think it mm -hmm. should change just there, definitely. Okay. Try and tell us uh, how you think it should change, if you can, or if there's any tools that would help you. And that's very useful information for us because we can take that away and have a little think about yeah. it. Yeah, um, more, help us, yeah, help the us. More help information you give us, the better, really. Yeah. More interactive and more simple for students to understand. Yeah, they want the tools to be user friendly. Yeah. Writing tools. Yeah. More collaborative. That's a really interesting point. Yeah. So technology can can really facilitate some things which are harder in the in, in your classroom. In fact, mm -hmm. um, so yeah. collaborative uh, activities where you're able to assess the input of all those individuals. That's an area where technology might be able to help much more in the future. Yeah. Friendly tools. <laughs> yes, friendly tools would be very good. I, I agree. OK, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. It's really important to um, work together to solve the challenges that we all face in the, in the teaching and assessment community. And if you're interested in helping shape the learning and assessment tools that we're working on at Cambridge English, please do visit our survey on online assessment after the webinar. You can also sign up to take part in user testing where you have a go at um, uh, tools that we released in early versions and also research with us. You can access the links from the PDF of these slides that you've downloaded and we'll also send them uh, to you after the webinar. OK, so now it's time for your questions. We've got some time left. Um, please type any questions you have about assessment for online learning into the chat. Um, and we'll have a go at answering them for you. So please write in now with your questions about assessment for online learning. I'm just having a look. So Sean, we've got one here. It says, what does integrated assessment mean? Oh, integrated assessment refers to whether you assess two skills together. So you may ask your learners to listen to a short podcast and then uh, ring up a friend and phone them to, uh, about to tell them about it. So that would be integrated listening and speaking. Or you might ask them to listen to a lecture and take notes and write a summary. So it's the way we use language in real life. So it, it, you, if you think of real life situations, um, you might find some ideas. Also, the CEFR has um, new descriptors on mediation, and they could give you some good ideas for um, designing integrated tasks. Mm. I've got one here as well, um, which is, uh, I mean, yeah, this is like a huge question. It's like, what do we do as teachers? What do we do if parents help their children? I mean, this is fascinating, isn't it? What do we do if parents help their children? It's, it's interesting because it's not just an assessment question, is it? Because if you think about the children in a class at school, some of those children have help from their parents when they do their homework. Some of those children have parents who encourage and motivate them to do their homework and to do other practice as well and to have good learning attitudes. Mm -hmm. And some parents, maybe they are busy, maybe there's lots of different reasons, isn't there? But some children get more support and some children get different kinds of support. Some might be focusing on different things. Some might be thinking about creativity, which is another kind of skill, which indirectly could even help assessment. But when you're thinking about assessment and parents helping their students in assessment, again, I think this comes to, Sean, maybe you agree with me, um, it comes down to attitudes and understanding what the purpose of assessment is. So I think if parents are, are helping their students, either you accept it, or you could try and, and change um, attitudes by providing information, yeah. by providing assessment criteria, yes. and by providing evidence as well about how far their learner is progressing mm -hmm. to those criteria. And making that transparent, making it clear and available to all of the stakeholders, the school, the learner, the parents and other teachers, I think that can only be a good thing in helping people understand where help is necessary and where help is less preferred as well. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know. What do you think, Sean? I, I, you was, have just, a good idea. I was just thinking about that <laughs> and wondering whether we could sort of give them. Um, to, I don't want to increase the burden on the teachers already. No. But if parents are involved in helping their students, then maybe we could give them sort of tips of the type of help they could give that would be useful. So mm. um, listening to a student practice um, a short talk or um, telling a story. Um, That's right. Definitely. And things like, you know, showing a learner where to click on the page. Yes. That's kind of OK. Yeah. yeah. But like telling them what the answer is. Yeah. That's probably not. <laughs> so but it is. We need to give uh, we need a do's and don'ts of helping your yeah. parents, uh, yeah. your students. Um, and that might great. that might vary as well, depending on the kind of student that you're that that you have. So it may be that you do have some students with additional needs and in which case it may be uh, more appropriate to provide additional support, like reading a text out loud, for example. So it's a complicated question. It is complicated. Um, <laughs> with a complicated want answer. To help their children. Yeah. Of course they do. Of course yeah. they do. We all want to help those learners to succeed. Um, let's have a look at the other questions. I've got a list here. Um, how can we manage marking if we have large classes? Okay. Um, it depends on what you're marking. I think Helen's described tools that can help with single item, yes, no, true, false, mm -hmm. and that will certainly re reduce the burden on you. Um, if you're marking students' writing, you may decide to not concentrate, blanket correct every single error because that would be hard work for you and utterly demoralising for the students. So you might may decide to say, this piece of work I'm just going to look at um, linkers that you use or um, tenses and just focus, give very focused um, correction uh, which would again lessen the burden on you and help them focus on one thing at a time so don't be selective in what you decide to focus on yeah i think that's right and using sort of more you know using more automated tools like a like a survey tool like typeform or, or mm -hmm. google forms or something like that and using multiple for choice questions is great for kind of getting, um, you know, themes and areas where there really are problems. And then maybe you can set more open tasks, writing tasks, speaking tasks around those problem areas to kind of refine your assessment, your evaluation of what the problems are and how to help them as well. So, yes, I think you have to be selective. Um, you don't want a situation where you just deliver loads of multiple choice because then you don't get the evidence that you need to be able to evaluate in the best way. Um, but at the same time, you know, it takes time. It takes time to mark open responses. It takes time to mark writing and speaking. So maybe look at some of those automarker tools and how they could help you. And write, write and improve is fantastic. I mean, that really does save a lot of time. That's a, a really good tool for that. Um, maybe one more question. Um, how often should teachers give feedback, Sean? Oh, I think we do all the time. I mean, I used to be a teacher and so did you, Helen. So um, yeah. I think feedback is going on, certainly in a classroom environment, all the time, in a perhaps in an informal way. So um, an online environment is slightly different, but I think you can have different kinds of feedback. And don't forget, feedback can be encouragement as well as correction. So, but please get your students involved in giving feedback to themselves by sharing those criteria, giving them perhaps a chart where they can, as the, like the example we saw for the self-assessment grid in the CFR, and asking them to think about their own performance and give feedback to themselves and set a goal for improvement. So you could say, I'm not you, they could perhaps say, I'm not using very many linkers. I'm going to improve um, my use of linkers and how are you going to do that? I'm going to underline linkers when I come across them in written work and try to use them in my own writing. So really get your students involved because um, it'll lower the burden on you and it'll make them more independent and uh, it, that's real learning. Yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, use the resource that you have in front of you, which is your learners, you know, help them to take control of their own learning pathway and, you know, inspire them to to be great at learning themselves for their own future i think that's a, a definite uh, yes for me um i think it's really very interesting if we 
if we think about teachers marking and evaluating learners, we're looking for the evidence, we're trying to gather the evidence. But if learners were in a position where they could bring the evidence to you, wouldn't that be fantastic? Because they could look at their video and, and say, look, this is evidence of me using my linking words. This is evidence of me interacting with my friend. You know, that, that would be fantastic. You can do that with video tools, yeah. Sean. I'm going to give you a very quick example of a teacher I know who's working in Italy, and she's recently asked her students to produce short podcasts as evidence of their speaking skills. And they designed this podcast, and some of them are actually submitting them to a podcast competition in the New York Times. <laughs> so, you know, the sky's the limit. All you need is imagination and yeah. have to work with a colleague to develop ideas and share ideas. Yeah, I think working with other teachers as well is a, is a really key part of that because, you know, it's not what, what we're saying. I mean, it's, it would be great but it's obviously hard to get there. You know, it takes time, it takes mm -hmm. uh, perseverance and any help that you can get from other yeah. teachers if you can work together to do stuff, that means yeah. you can support each other along the way. Mm -hmm. I definitely recommend that yes. as well. A community of practice um, to support and to share materials and ideas, I think is, is the way forward, particularly now with the new challenges of online teaching. That's right. Okay, Sean, we've we've hit our um we're, right. we're slightly over time, in fact. Okay. <laughs> so we, we hope that you have found this session useful. Um I'm just gonna finish showing you a couple of resources. I'm not going to go through them in depth, but they are there in the PDF, the handout um for you to have a look at after this session. So I'll briefly go through a few of them. Um don't forget that this is the first in a series of webinars. So we've got other ones coming up about assessing specific skills online. So we've got speaking, writing, and then reading and listening um, next week and the week after, and the week after that. Um, this is a list of tools, but you don't have to use all of these tools. There's some ideas. And perhaps if you go to those other webinars, you'll see some more depth, uh, in-depth examples that might help you to decide whether they're relevant for you in your classroom. Um, we've given you links to the CEFR, the new companion volume, and also a video. I noticed someone asked a question about this earlier. This is a video about applying the CEFR to your curriculum. So we've given you the link there as well in case that's useful. And then on our website, We've got lots of supporting materials mm -hmm. also on the Cambridge University Press website. And we've got some exam boosters as well, which are available. So they're all there to help you, to support you um, in supporting your learners um, with their learning and assessment. So thank you very much. Don't forget to download that PDF or to look out for it in the email that will follow. Um, and then you can get all those links to the resources that we've shared. Um, it's been a real pleasure hearing from you in the chat. It's, it's fascinating. It's really important that we all work together and share our experiences um, and our opinions as well um, to move this forward. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. Yes, thank you. And thank you for being so responsive. Yeah, Bye-bye. Bye-bye.